Hi friends, it's Jennifer Swales from Honeybee Astrology back to talk about the full moon in Scorpio, which is happening today, April 23rd. Um, this moon is occurring at four degrees of Scorpio and it is squaring, or I should say the full moon conjunction happens just after the square to Pluto in Aquarius. So there's loads here, loads. I want to talk about all of it. And then I'm going to talk about Uranus at the end. But uh, this is the first lunation that we've had in the kind of Taurus Scorpio section that it hasn't been an eclipse uh, cycle, right? In about three and a half, four years. So I think that bodes well for us because we were clearing out, right? The, with the North Node having been in Scorpio, we, we've already done some of the really kind of heavy personal um, clearing out of, of the kind of uh, residual muck, right? And I'll get more specific into that, but uh, this full moon, although it is squaring Pluto, Pluto's newly into Aquarius. So th this is like the first kind of opening salvo about what the, the, the 20 years will hold for us. So it's very exciting in that sense. And a lot of people are not doing very, uh, poorly with Pluto now in Aquarius. If you have planets and air signs, right, planets or points and air signs, well, you're dealing with air all of your life. If you have planets and a sign, that means you have work to do there. So now that Pluto has come to Aquarius, it's like we're all kind of being asked to take the, the, the bigger view of our life to decide what stays, because this is the sign that whose sign whose ancient ruler is Saturn, right? Some things can stay and other things can go in order to reform, in order to get better and evolve. So this is just the beginning of that process, but it's not an eclipse. So it's like any kind of karmic lessons that needed to be experienced, you've already done that, right? That's probably been playing out in this, the Uranus in, in Jupiter conjunction in, in Taurus probably was a bit of a wrap up, right? Remember, because Jupiter can be culminating energy where you get the wisdom. And then if not, here comes the universe serving you up another dish of deliciousness so you can kind of get the lesson. We're still, we're just as of today with the full moon coming out of the eclipse energy, right? So um, those reverberations will play out in the next six months to a year. But even bigger of a blessing is that we've had Mercury retrograde in Aries. So really what we've been doing is thinking about ourselves through the, through the lens of the past and how we have behaved. Thinking about kind of our own, again, like uh, need to survive and maybe when we, we, we weren't so much threatened and how we perceived it, right? How do we use our fawning? How do we stay alive, right? How do we claim the parts of ourselves that we had to kind of dismember, right? We had to cut our own balls off. We're talking about Uranus energy. Now, how can we remember and get back to really our own intuitive fire, which is what Aries is? So Mars is the ruler of Aries. We just had the Aries new moon eclipse, right? The solar eclipse was a new moon when the sun and the moon stand together, which is why it's so amazingly dramatic. But also, too, it's like it broke the kind of veil that we're not all Aries. We are all Aries. And hopefully it, it, pu it put you more in touch with that energy of, of, of your will, right? But Aries has another sign. <laughs> that other sign uh, is Scorpio. So now we're in the Scorpio full moon. So we're getting a whole month of strong Martian energy. In Aries, it's yang, it's projected outward. It's a re it's reactive, it's a reactionary energy, right? This pisses me off, I react to it. This threatens me, I react to it, right? You feel it in your body, you feel physically threatened. Now we're in the Mars ru ruled water sign, right? So uh, fire is irrational, meaning that it's not above rational, right? It doesn't consider the mindscape. Mars is actually the, the 
um, sworn enemy to Athena, who rules rationalization. Uh, excuse me, Apollo does as well with the sun. But, you know, we think about Athena born from Zeus's brain. That's, that's brilliance personified, right? Mars is reactive. He's, he's fighting. He's a fighting principle to keep you alive. So you can't really be living in your mind or in the mindscape or in the psyche to survive. You have to be able to react, and Mars does that. In fire, irrational, above the mental scape. When we get into water, that's what we call a rational function of the psyche, right? Water is a collective uh, consciousness experience, meaning that it accumulates. You, you ever spill a little water, right? Or you ever, you ever cut yourself and it seems to be like buckets of blood uh, from the smallest little nick? Because water flows, right? Water accumulates very quickly. Water's strong. Think about, uh, you know, I, I had some flooding in my basement, uh, this never ending sump pump story. And so, I had to really go through and, and clear out the wreckage uh, because water picked up heavy weighted things and seeped into them and, and weighted them or, you know, moved them wherever it wanted to. So it was like, you can't control water, right? It, it's, but you have to kind of mentally get a handle on how you're going to address it. And so that's why we say the kind of water or the feeling element it includes rationality. It includes your kind of mental sphere. And that's very important. So when we think about Mars being the enemy of Athena, we see kind of passion versus rationality. But when we're in Scorpio, we have to kind of, we're in all of it, right? We're in the feelings, we're in the rationality, we're in the, the reactivity. And so this is where people kind of will suppress themselves in Scorpio. Scorpio, I just want to give every Scorpio a hug. Uh, Scorpio is my third house, and so I'll show you how it plays out for me. The third house is the house of siblings, cousins, and neighbors. Because I am an Aries, I'm very reactive fire, right? And so a lot of this Chiron eclipse has been really forcing me to look at how much energy I squander right? How much I give to things that are not mine because they, they seem to come under the purview of mine, of my son, right? How I, I take on too much burden, how um, that, you know, Pisces in the seventh house, people bleed into me. I'm very compassionate with passion. I bring my passion to their plight and I have to try to be better about not being responsible for everyone else's stuff right? That's part of my, but also too, it's learning how to delegate, learning how to not, not do it myself, right? So th this to my mind really kind of plays out in my yard. So my yard is whatever it is, because when you get me outside of my house, you get me into Libra and you have Uranus there, right? I have Uranus there. So whatever comes out of my mouth might be shocking. And so I can get a little, so now that Libra energy because I know I, I neglect my yard, because I know I don't like to deal with it, because I like to do things myself. I love to clean. And so I do like to do it, but my yard is just so massive. It's not possible for me to do it. And then it forces me to hold a hard line with my children to help. And then it forces me, when, when truth be told, I just want to get away when I go out to the yard and rake. I don't want to it, it, it puts me in Scorpio, so I can be in my kind of feelings, in my mental scape, in my reactivity. I can process a lot of the kind of Martian things I do because I have three planets in Aries. So I have issues with Aries energy, right? So as soon as I pick up my rake, I start, my mind starts spinning. And I'm thinking about my neighbors, thinking about, oh, coming up to me saying, oh, you're finally working on your lawn, right? Or, oh, boy, you really did a lot of work there. Have you considered this other part, right? Because the world is an imperfect place and the yard always needs work. And I've cut down 80 trees. I took Mars right to them, right? And so I've done quite a lot. You can't really expect me to put all of my my assets and all of my time and my functioning into my, my lawn. 
no, no, no. I'm never even out there, right? So pff, I don't care about it. But that is also Scorpio energy. That kind of eighth house, don't tell me what to do ener energy. That anti-authoritarian energy that says, I need to bust out of this, right? I can't be held to your kind of standards of thinking or, or your what you prioritize as the neighborhood beautification. I don't care about that, right? Because I would be a slave to it otherwise. So we all need that kind of Scorpio energy where the stinger is out to kind of keep us safe from other people's kind of Libra priorities. So it's a wrestling match, right? Between the, ne the needs of yourself in, in relationship and partnership with others, in with everything, or the needs of what are my resources? What am I giving to this? Am I giving too much? right? Do I, do I need to bust out of this conventional way of thinking? Well, I have Uranus there, so I'm busting out of it anyways. So, and I know this. And so when I'm in my mind, I'm kind of going through all of the worst case scenarios about every single neighbor who's ever commented on my lawn, good or bad, and I'm revisiting and I'm battling them in my mind. And it also is a, a happy distraction from something that's a bit greater and I don't want to deal with, right? It's, it's a way of kicking the can down the road where I have this other Uranian thing that came up with the conjunction. And, and again, I'm, I'm wrestling with what is mine to do here, right? What is mine to do? Do I go after it? Do I pursue it? Do I kind of put all my energy to it or do I take the pause? Well, you know, Mercury in retrograde has been showing me you need to pause more. You need to rest more. Everything crashed with my computers and my, my phone and everything. No, 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 no. Your ambition, ambition makes you look really ugly, right? I need to temper that. So I'm out there, I'm doing my thing, blah, blah, blah. So then my neighbor, who is always kind of my, my chief nemesis, right, comes out. And, I, and I've already had, uh, I, I know exactly what I'm going to say to him. And he says, hey, looking good. And he, he goes on his merry way. And I say, oh, thanks, ba, ba, ba. It's nothing, right? It, in my mind, it was this grand battle. And of course it wasn't, because I'm not going to battle with him. He's 74 years old. He's got a bad heart. I know everything about him, right? I know exactly who he is, and he's lovely. But his house faces my house, so he has to look at my yard in whatever state it's in. So he's automatically, in that sense, oppositional to me, right? And so it was fine. It was nothing. Because I know myself, I know I'm doing it. I know I'm on the edge of saying whatever. And I don't, to prepare myself to not go to war with him, I have to go to war with him in my mind. It's a very conscious thing, right? I'm a Virgo. Virgos are completely kind of aided by having that sextile to Scorpio because they could see the, the good and the bad in things and they can make a better decision. They can weigh all of the kind of ethical and moral responses that are inherent in making a Virgo decision of how can I survive? It's a further kind of refinement of the survival principle. So Scorpio is, is the Mars sign, the Mars ruled water sign. So now think about Mars. I want to talk about um, the hill of Athens. This is the kind of landmark that exists in Athens, right? It's a marble rock, it's a massive rock. It sits below the Acropolis, meaning it sits below the kind of the realm of the gods, but it sits above the marketplace, right? So there's a, a thinking of, there's the marketplace where we exchange, where we have our kind of tit, tit, tit for tat nonsense, right? And then there is the rock which is Mars, which is where we decide to kind of take out our sword and use it. And then we have the realm of the gods. Well, when we're talking about Promethean energy, when we're talking about Uranus, when Prometheus gives the fire of the gods to man, right? They needed to become 
more independent because they weren't the God's pets anymore. We weren't the God's playthings anymore, right? We had to take on more responsibility for ourselves. Whatever Uranus probably showed you last week was probably uh, awakening in the sense of, oh, there's one, there's more work to do here, which there always is, but two, I'm gonna have to actually take on more physical responsibility in Taurus. And I don't wanna do it, but it's gonna free me from a kind of beholdenness, which is a very kind of Libra Scorpionic value. So uh, um, at the Hill of Aries, this is the site in which, uh, what's uh, interesting and, and very often not talked about is that uh, Mars has children, right? Mars has his sons, uh, Deimos and, and Phobos, right? Fear and panic. But he also has daughters. Imagine what that daughter was like. Imagine what that daughter was like at a party, right? So that daughter tangled with a son of Poseidon. And the son of Poseidon hurt her. So Mars, being responsible for his daughter, killed the son. And it was at the hill of, of Ares where the, the judgment was rendered, right? So Mars pleads his case in Poseidon, Neptune pleads his case, right? And then all of the other judge, uh, judges sit in judgment upon this. But this is below the Acropolis. This is, this is something of, of the gods playing out in the world of men, right? With the children. So the judgment went for Aries, right? It was found that because although he, the son had hurt the daughter, right? Aries was justified in, in exacting revenge because it went against the, the higher principle of one, fathers are meant to teach their children what's appropriate. Right? And so whatever she was doing was probably somewhat appropriate. So she was behaving in a way that was kind of in line with her paternal values. But also, and more importantly, and more ideal, is the notion that you don't hurt or prey on the weaker. Right? Because in this patriarchal way of thinking, the son of Poseidon, is still stronger than Mars, Mars's daughter, which is true, right? The outer planets hold more potency. They are more of the divine. And so the higher mind has to come when we're dealing with these higher values. And also this notion of what is kind of justice, Libra, right? All people are responsible for their behaviors. These are the laws of men, right? But when we're talking about the gods, we're talking about exalted principles. So the notion that Poseidon, who is Zeus's brother, right? That they that he should have kind of taught his son in the way which is of Zeus, which is of the highest mind, right? Then there is Mars, who is Zeus's son. Zeus and Hera hate Mars. They hate everything about him. They abhor him, right? And yet Mars defends his daughter. And yet Mars keeps his sons close. So uh, Mars is a very is a very unhappy mirror to to Zeus in the sense that despite not loving me, dad, I still love my children. In spite being abhorrent to you. I'm still here being a better dad than you ever were. What's more Mars or Scorpio than that, right? Very often our parenting styles are reactions to our parents. With every eclipse, we get to work out more stuff about, which ultimately starts at our foundation. It starts with our family of origin, right? And so in this Hill of Aries story, we get the notion of humans, of, of the gods struggling now, that, the, that humans aren't their pets, right? Or, or that we're causing kind of ancestral damage to our, our ourselves, which are also gods, right? That Zeus and Hera wounded Mars, and that's why he is the god of war. 
it, it's chicken and it's egg, right? So you can blame your parents till the cows come home, but ultimately it lives in you in this behavior. It, it, it's either conscious or it's unconscious, right? It's either, either you're looking at it or you're turning your blind eye to it, but you are reacting. And the and again, your life around you shows you what you're doing, right? If we don't engage in the energy, like me arguing with my neighbor, I'm gonna go out and do it, right? If I'm not aware that I'm capable of it, that I'm capable of saying shocking things. And when I say shocking things, they're not really shocking. I'll give you another example. I was out in, because you know, we're in, we were in this Aries energy. I'm out with my dogs. I always say that both of my dogs are avatars of my personality. My Boston Terrier is all happiness and joy and light. He's fun and he's just love. He's love personified, right? My Cavalier King Charles Spaniel is very aloof. She's very cool, right? So is she the kind of um, protective moon element of me or is she that kind of Virgo of the, I'm always a lazy Virgo. She's always looking a little bit more unkept than she should be, but you know, um, she has that kind of detachment, that air detachment. He does not, he's all heart and soul. So I was at the park with them and I'm talking to another Boston Terrier owner and we're trading stories because if your dogs are a kind of um, avatar of yourself, right? We kind of create our world everywhere in our material world, right? That's Taurus. And then the more stuff we accumulate, hopefully with greater sense of sensation, right? Virgo, we learn discernment, and then Capricorn, we learn kind of the best of the best. What's worth working for? So, what, based on Saturn, based on kind of time and tide and the kind of principles, the higher principles of, of life, right? Wisdom, not just reactivity. So I go from this fun, you know, we're laughing out loud, and then the next people I see are five people with a Virgo, with a, a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, a Ruby Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. So I'm still in my kind of Aries puppiness energy. And I say to them, oh, wow, how funny from a, from a Boston Terrier to, to a Cavalier King Charles Spaniel. I said, oh, so, you know, now I get to be my kind of more reserved, quiet side. But because I just said that, I kind of just failed as a Virgo, right? I should have kept it all in and been more reserved. And then of course I laughed out loud and one guy laughed really loud and everyone else turned heel and walked away. <laughs> and it was awesome because they were all just pristinely dressed. They were really just these kind of muddy, muddied, beautiful, uh, suburban, archetypal people, right? For me to interact with and for me to kind of uh, uh, bring my Libra Uranus, right? And they, they then I, I probably was shocking to them and they probably didn't like what I was saying, right? Because no one likes to think of themselves as being personified by their dog. So they left, right? And then the one guy who laughed out loud, he, he, he got it, he knew. I said the thing, I said the quiet thing out loud, right? And that's what happens when I step outside my door or you come into a purview. I don't mean it to be harmful. It's just it can be, right? And I have to be mindful of this with Scorpio in the third house. All Virgos do. So when we think about this story about the hill of Aries, it illuminates so much for us as human beings, right? Because we are very reactive to our families of origin or to the people around us, whether we perceive it or not. And we do have a kind of deepest, darkest, hidden, wounded parts of ourselves. And yet, it's only by acknowledging that and feeling the kind of, it, it never feels good to have someone, when I'm trying to make a joke and then they turn tail and walk away, it, that doesn't feel good, right? I'm trying to be my best self always. I'm always trying to, work on myself, right? Work on my own issues. And so you try, you bring yourself out and you try with people. Scorpio is where we hide that rejection. Scorpio is where we kind of dump it into the well, right? And then it churns. 
and depending on how willing we are to look at what has really hurt us, the times that we felt rejected, even by our own parents, right? And what that created, what kind of overcompensating mechanisms, right? So with Mars, who feels active hatred from his parents, his, his response is, F you, I'm going to do whatever I want, right? I'm going to challenge your brother. I'm going to challenge the patriarchy. I'm going to challenge all of your thinking, right? And I'm going to defend my daughter because it's justified. And then you step to me on, on this rock, right? Think about a, a trophy. It, it, inherently, Mars created a bit of a competition, a competition. He creates a competition of values, right? Or of sense of value of yourself. Because when we hurt people, we want them to forgive us, right? We want them to take us back into their love. Nothing tastes as good as the hand that feeds, right? And we're constantly kind of bucking the sense of, I need to break out, right? We, we have these kind of, I, I want to do what I want. I want to, I want to fight and I want to blank, you know what I mean? And I want to, I want to go, I want to conquer, right? That inherently there is competition in everything because we're, we're not endless resources. We are not of the gods. We are here to make something of our lives. But the truth of the matter is, is that ultimately we're just trying to engage in the myth of creation, which is creation and then the fall, right? And then redemption and then creation, right? This is the, this is the notion of like, of Adam and Eve, right? Created perfect, given everything. And then there was the fall because they had to go a little bit more. They needed a little bit more. Well, we're human beings and we're always expanding. Our consciousness is always expanding. So yeah, we're always gonna be a little bit more. While we're alive, we're, get, we're gaining more. We're voracious. The North Node is in Aries. We want more for ourselves, right? But what are you consuming? What are you feasting on? Right? Are you feasting on your children? Are you feasting on your old habits of being? Are you feasting on yourself? Are you refusing to acknowledge that I'm hurting here and I don't know where I went wrong, but I'm on the wrong path? Or this is the hill I'm going to die on. Right? Think about that, that hill of Aries. Right or wrong, right? Justified with the higher mind or just for retribution this is the house i'm this is the hill i'm gonna die on that hill in greece and athens ended up being where they would kind of where humans would judge people who are accused of capital crimes right not petty not petty crimes not in the marketplace where we kind of say nasty things to each other and we spurn each other right and we kind of we can ignore each other we're talking about like real offenses because that's happily, that's all that is there in Scorpio. We don't bring every little kind of little nicky necky thing. Those are the kind of words that that's, that's our conversation on the chain gang. That's how we talk to each other because it, it, people rarely say what's true about them, right? They act it out. This is why when we ha we're talking about morality, right? Morality, to a certain extent, is necessary, but it's also a joke, right? Because we know people lie. We know they cheat. We know they steal. We know they'll do whatever they have to do to survive, right? And that we will too. And that we've all made mistakes. And we've all hurt people that we loved. But that the truest part of the hurt is the hurt that we've done to ourselves, the parts that, of ourselves that we've killed off, right? The parts of ourselves that we've kind of took advantage of the weaker, right? The parts of ourselves that we've kind of perceived ourselves as the victim and that allowed us to act out however we please. And that's Scorpio too, right? That's the, I'm dedicated to you, Right? This is kind of that one of those um, archetypal, archetypal uh, um, ideas of the animus, right? 
I'm subjugating myself for you, right? You were the lesser of the two evils. So uh, I picked the safe one, but my, mo my most truest self, right? The, my passion, I, I killed that for you, right? Or uh, I really love that other person and I settled for you, right? And so I'm gonna take it out on you because you're keeping me from my best self. That's why Aries wins that kind of uh, the judgment on the hill of Aries, right? That's why Mars will win because Mars ultimately is embodied energy and Neptune is ultimately um, intergenerational or higher minded energy. Meaning that when you feel like you are sacrificing, when you are self-sacrificing, right, for somebody else, the only thing that's going to break you out of that and, and keep you in out of, out of this kind of concretized Libra dynamic that we can all get into, right? Saturn, Saturn is exalted in Libra. The only way to break out of that is, is Mars, is Aries, is to, is to cheat, is to lie, is to steal, is to cut right? Because it's the only way that paradigms fall. It's the only way things get killed off, right? So creation, the fall, and then it, that dies off, and then the best of it remains, right? The love remains. But that this is the cycle of kind of transformation, right? This is what Pluto is always kind of creeping up and presenting us. Oh, okay, you slayed that demon that ate you? You slayed that dragon that ate you? Well, here's another dragon, right? Because we're always growing and we're always battling. Battling our own nature and battling with everybody else. Scorpio's where we look at it. So with this full moon, something will come out. I'm going to go through the signs, but something can come up, right? That is very plutonic in nature. And so what I mean by that, it's not... It's not kind of death. It's the difference between killing, actively killing something and then death, okay? Because the dead never really die, right? We are all haunted in various ways. And so when you actually kill something or you try to, in Scorpionic, transform it, the echoes will still remain, right? Because the outer planets still remain. The kind of intergenerational hurt and wounding will still remain. And so this is important to think about because we're going to have Mars conjunct Neptune. I need to take a sip of my tea. Excuse me. Okay. On March 15th, that was when um, Mercury conjuncted the North Node. So now, today is the 23rd, Tomorrow, is it tomorrow? I have my notes actually, which is shocking for me. Okay, so Mercury is direct on Thursday, right? Mercury is turning direct, right? So stationing tomorrow, today's the 23rd, stationing tomorrow, and then turning direct on Thursday. So our mindscape and our wounds are hurting. It's very much amplified, right? Because that, that's a station right now. That's a station Mercury. Excuse me. So we're thinking about the past. We're thinking about our future projections, where we want to burst out, where our intuition has been goading us to go. We're going to go there, right? So on Thursday after the full moon, the moon um, is going to trine Mars and Neptune, right? And it's going to stand in opposition to Uranus and Jupiter. So whatever happened with the conjunction, we're going to revisit that probably on Thursday, right? Think about it like this. Uranus um, is our collective, our, our connection to the collective unconscious. Whatever came up, these are generational issues. They don't get solved in a day. They get solved in waves. This might have been a wrap up. This might be the bow on the top of that wrap up, that culminating energy that might come through on Thursday, right? Mercury is going to be direct. So we want to want to have a clean slate. We're going to clear the air so we can go after what we individually want. And that's going to look different for everybody else. And depending on how you have been dealing with your Mars energy, can you show Mars compassion? Understanding that Mars acts with passion, right? 
but also that even that cutting, that burningness, it's the same kind of wounding we all feel. That's what Scorpio is. It's the, it's the notion that you've been hurt and I've been hurt and it all sucks, right? And none of it's justified. But how can we kind of stand up for the, the, the daughter of us all to a certain extent, right? How can we fight for the wounded part of ourselves and kind of, and in that sense, allow for healing? Because the kind of, it's the difference between being alive and being dead, right? Wounding people actively and understanding that death is, death gives you no, you have no advocacy anymore. You have no ability to change things anymore. That's what's happening right now. That's how important this is, right? You can either choose life or choose and choose to kind of strike out with this new Uranian awareness or you can concretize yourself a little bit more. You can suppress a little bit more. You can you can try to kind of force that demon down until the next go round, till the next Uranus, till the next evolution. Uranus is moving into Gemini in 2026. So if we don't do it in our environment, in our sensations, it's going to become so much more combative. That's what we're thinking about right now, okay? Friday moon and Sag applying to a trine to Neptune. Okay, so, and then a square to Saturn. So now as the moon moves off this full moon, it's going to be squaring Saturn and Pisces. So it's, excuse me, uh, I'm sorry, when it moves into Sag, it will be from a square. So right now with this full moon, it's, it's, it's providing a trine from the scorpionic energy to the Pisces energy, right? There's forgiveness on offer, there's healing there but they need, doors need to close, right? Old ways of being need to go, right? Forgive yourself for the things that you did. Forgive others for the things that you did. See the humanity in it all, okay? And then move forward with the better, right? Squares our motivation. That trying to Mercury is gonna kind of get us more in touch with our fire element. So that's the gorgeousness about, uh, scorpionic energy too. When we do the scorpionic work, it kind of brings us to a separate piece with the mental kind of fighting with Athena, right? And we can embody in our, in our philosophy of living more of the fire. When we don't do our scorpionic work, we kind of, we, 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 we hold on with, to the depth grip with the depth of with the pain of the pain and we don't speak our words we don't speak our truth we won't let people see us in all vulnerability and then we get up on our soapbox and we preach to others but it's a false preaching right it, it's not true it comes from a place of kind of putting on more martian armor to project to protect that which we feel most vulnerable that which is living in the 12th house just start to look at it just look at it right now. This is this is water. This is consciousness. You don't have to do anything right now, right? It's receptive energy. Just kind of receive and feel the feelings and try to kind of go a little bit deeper into, is this, Mars is the weather, right? It wasn't my neighbor saying, looking good. It was, it was every kind of rejection I ever had about every time I felt like I failed and I didn't do enough, particularly when it was not really mine to do, right? Uh, that's what I'm wrestling with. I'm not wrestling with my weeds. I don't care about that. Think about that. Okay, so next week we're going to have, so then Tuesday, the moon is going to oppose, no, the moon's going to chunk Pluto, uh, conjunct Pluto, uh, Tuesday of next week. Did I skip the weekend? Oh, I'm so bad at this. Not really good at the kind of Virgo and day-to-day -day details. I, I, it's the bigger picture that interests me, and, and I want to try to capture for you. So now, but it's important to think about that because on Tuesday, when the moon conjuncts that Pluto, we're going to get a kind of deeper understanding of what Pluto is asking us to kind of release and to heal. When we think about scorpionic energy, we think about the tower, right? How in Scorpio, it's like, I have this need, I'm gonna repress it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna 
I'm gonna try to kill it, right? I can't kill it, and then it, it, it rears its ugly head and I act out, right? And then I blame others for why I did that. And then I never get closer to why I actually act. I never, I never get closer to the fire. I never get closer to uh, the need that, ne I, that I'm ignoring, right? And so th this is when you have couples who say, don't tell so-and-so that I did X, Y, Z, right? Because the need is there. In Scorpio, we kind of bring others in as our kind of our partners in crime, right? And that creates more intimacy with them, but it creates more self-loathing within us because we're not actually owning the need. We, we've just found other people to misbehave with, right? And that's fine, but that's just kicking the bill down the road. You're just kicking the can down the road, right? All of that woundedness, it's compound interest. The bill just gets bigger and then the tower comes down. The relationship ends because you, you don't even know where you sacrificed yourself or where you cut off your own balls, right? You blame the other person for what you did to yourself. And you feel even cheaper and less because you kind of ran around with these other people. When you what you really wanted was to be closer to your partner, to be closer to the stability and the love, right? Or maybe the tower had to come down because you just you got involved with something that that work wasn't yours to do and you thought it was. Now it's time to do your own work. And then we step into the star. We step into the healing. We step into the Aquarius, right? So that's the other side of Scorpio and Aquarius is that to be the star, to have a star, to kind of to, to aim your compass towards something means you need to be vulnerable, to, to really own it, to go after it, right? Because... To wish upon a star means that you have to do the work as well. You have to embody the intuition to go after it. And that leaves you vulnerable to black holes, to people who will suck that energy in, right? Who will try to kind of harness that fire and that passion and that healing for themselves. Because it's hard to be the star. It's not easy to go after a dream. It takes tenacity. It takes will. It takes faith. It takes the kind of outer planet gumption. And when we're talking about Pluto, we're talking about every human being that's ever existed has always wanted these kind of higher star virtues for themselves. That's why they kind of echo and reverberate through the generations. Pluto reminds us of that, you know, the, the underworld isn't just where we keep the kind of corpses, it's where we keep their struggles, it's where we keep their epic poems, it's where we keep their, their travails, right, and that they were worth it. And now Pluto says, okay, bring this to everything else that is in your domain. Bring this to your society, it needs it now, right? Bring your love, bring your healing, bring your compassion. And you have to kind of be aware that other people are going to try to black hole you when you do. That might be part of the kind of conjunction of the moon to the Pluto where you try to, maybe it's the first time that you've actually been able to see where the black holes are that you haven't been able to kind of recognize yet. We're in new paradigms now, right? Because Mercury's going to be moving forward. So we've kind of regrouped. We're going to be going forward now. Pluto is going to retrograde. So he's so strong right now. The fear is palpable because we're just about to step into our new lives. But he's going to retrograde. So everything that kind of we've sowed the seeds of, we're going to go back and do the internal and external work. Right? Pluto never stops. Internally and externally. But now we get to kind of get the lessons. We get to regroup and heal ourselves. That's the gorgeousness of the retrograde. When planets go retrograde, it's like they're less of our volition and they're more of what is inherently fated for us. We'll be acting out, right? We'll be doing. Mercury's going to be going. Mars is still direct. These are the weather planets. We are still always kind of direct. We're always functioning. We're always accumulating. We're always working. It's, I'm trying to show you the higher themes, okay? So you can see them and recognize them. When you understand your own patterns, you can. It, it gives you the ability to climb out of the well, right? It gives you the ability to change 
course, to step into that Sag kind of power of intuition and go forward, right? We're almost done with Jupiter and Taurus. In May, he moves into Gemini. Things are going to speed up incredibly. So these, these ch different changes, or, you know, in these different retrograde patterns, they're, they're always for our kind of recalibrating recal of ourselves, of our internal kind of compass. The moon is going to conjunct the north node on Saturday. Mars is moving into Aries. Mars is kind of garnering his strength, all of his primordial forces. He's stepping right into his power. Things are going to change. They're going to start, we're going to start really moving as of Saturday. And Venus is going to square Pluto, right? So now Venus and Mars are always two sides of the same coin, right? Think about it. Venus defended his daughter. He defended the girl. He defended the feminine. Mars is always the other side of Venus, right? Venus is the only thing that conquers Mars, right? Mars, the reactivity, is constantly in tension with Athena, the mental scape, right? But the only thing that soothes the savage beast is love, is graciousness, right? It is Venus. And so when Venus squares Pluto, Venus and Aries, we're going to be asked, how are we kind of bringing our graciousness to our will? Or how can we refine those skills? Okay? How can we kind of step more into active love as a principle, right? Love is an action word. And that and that's why Venus being in Aries is really gorgeous, right? We can kind of take on more of what inherently we use, usually let flow to us. That's a good thing. We're going to have a supercharged Mars now, right? This is a new Mars. He's gone through the Kazemi with Saturn. The bottom line is clear, right? Our willpower has been kind of laying dormant, dreaming, right? So now we have Mars conjunct Neptune. Think about the hill right? Think about what are the kind of ideals I want to live, the greater values of compassion, and am I bringing it to myself, right? Possibly if, if Mars had some more ability to bring compassion to himself, or was able to kind of receive the forgiveness of Poseidon, of Neptune, right? Or was able to kind of take the hard edge off those memories, he wouldn't be so, he wouldn't have, have, have struck down the sun. It, it didn't need to be complete retribution, right? Where can we bring these kind of higher minded attributes of faith? The thing, everything is happening exactly when it's meant to, and everything is always working out in our best interest. Where can we bring that kind of soothing balm to our Mars and to our Neptune, right? As the kind of the sacred parts of ourselves that we very often have had to sully to just survive in this world, right? How can we reclaim more of that? When I think about this right now, I think about kind of, you know, that that hill of Aries is where St. Paul kind of went to, to wrote his letters to the Athenians, right? Went to testify, went to be the martyr, right? Because Mars saints, they're just humans trying to kind of speak to something that's higher, that they have discovered for themselves, that, that works, some kind of love thy neighbors as you do yourself, some kind of higher-minded principle, right? So Paul brings his his early Christian views to the hills of, of, to the hill of Aries, right? Where he tries to wrestle with the kind of pagans, you know, with the, with the people who idolatry, idolatrize. And they say, he says, I see idols everywhere, right? That was in the time before the Promethean fire was gifted, meaning that they used to slaughter a calf because a calf had real value, right? Uh, Think about Taurus, right? That that had actual value. So that was the gift to the gods where you would say, I turn it all over to you, 
right? Please, uh, Athena, please, Mars, do my bidding. Please uh, take pity on me. But when we kind of cultivate the archetypes within ourselves, when we see this mug that my kids brought me back from Quebec as a kind of a, an idol, right? It's like, I love you. I went on a travel. I went on a journey. I brought this token back to you because you weren't with me and I missed you, right? But that had to be sacrificed for me to go on this trip. And so I bring this back to kind of sacrifice it on the altar of love on the altar of my family unit is a fractured thing and I go places with my dad and yet I bring you a token still because there is still gorgeousness and unity and faith and love that exists between us as a family even though the family isn't a family anymore. So although this is a, just a mug uh, and I have a million mugs, it, it's meant to kind of be a sacrifice on the altar to the higher values that we're all cultivating within ourselves all the time. That's Neptune. That's forgiveness. That's compassion. Excuse me. We've killed our gods, right? We, we've supplanted them with stuff. And now we have to kind of cultivate, cultivate the wisdom of the gods, of the higher mind, to find it within ourselves and reclaim it, to reclaim ourselves. That's what I think is going on here. It's more about getting in touch with your life and how you've kind of, where you are worshiping, right? Because attention is love. Uh, attention is care. So we're always worshiping. We're always growing. Can you kind of turn that jewel, right? Can you turn that eye of the the eye that the three sisters of the fates share, right? Turn that jewel to get a different perspective of your suffering, of your life, of your kind of time in this realm to actually change things, to actually feel better, to actually get better, to actually be better, right? I mean, that's what's going on here. That's what Mars does. It's always striving to keep us alive, yes, but to, to, to have us kind of reclaim more of the ethics of our lives right reclaim more of the love of our lives only venus champions mars so when we're thinking about this full moon there's quite a lot going on here right this is what kind of this is what revelation is right when when you see mundane things in a glorified way and they speak to you more and that kind of gets you more in touch with yourself this is what sublime painting does right when you see the the, the awe of all the gorgeousness right now uh, uh, everything is blooming right it goes hand in hand with the notion that everything dies and you will die to, too and everything that you love will absolutely die too and how are you honoring that? That's really the masterpiece of your life. And that's worth fighting for. There are huge changes happening right now. And so can we see what's happening? And can we do the work? Can we face ourselves and how we've betrayed ourselves, right? How we've been forced to betray ourselves and how we continue to hold on to those things that don't serve us anymore. Let go, purge. This is the time, right? And while everything is blooming and coming back into life, reclaim those parts of yourself that you thought were dead, but you're still alive, so they're not dead. So how can you bring them back? Can you use them to climb out of the well? Nobody wants to be in the well. Nobody wants to bitch all day, every day, and feel completely powerless to change their lives. And that's not true. And that's why people struggle, because they are. it is possible. Change is right there, but it all starts with understanding you and who you are. And, and right now is another glorious gift from the universe. It is the Scorpio full moon. So when the knives come out, which inevitably they will, when people don't behave the way you want them to, or when hurtful things are said and done, try to turn the jewel and, and see your own woundedness, but also see them as acting out of a place of woundedness too right and then try to hold your response as being okay you hurt me but this is an opportunity right now to kind of take off a little bit of armor and let you see something more of 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 our relationship because we're always in relationships with each other right with our environment 
with everything that our life is. So how can we kind of get closer to the kind of more beautiful things that require hard work that Libra is, right? And how can we get away from the kind of reactivity and need to hide, right? How can we challenge paradigms without having to kind of bring down the tower? That is my hope and prayer for you at this time. Until we connect again, thank you. Jennifer Swales, Honeybee Astrology. Always forget to say these things, and now I'm going to go into the signs. Aries. Aries, this is a very difficult time for you, undoubtedly, because um, you can't necessarily see Scorpio, right? You don't necessarily understand what you get from other people in partnership. Maybe the best and maybe the worst, and how you claim that as your own. That chironic wound is saying, is that really your responsibility? Or, conjunctly, is it saying, is it your responsibility and you're not looking at it? That you've turned a blind eye to something that really is your issue. It's not really the other person's issue. And when that person in relationship acts out and you get the Scorpio full moon part of it, right? How much of it can you see as being theirs and how much of it can you see as being yours? And can you take the steps to, to rectify internally? Remember, Mars is heading toward, Mars is going your way. So all of this kind of dreaminess, it's about to step right into kind of the weather, right? Hopefully, hopefully you've kind of been cultivating more compassion towards yourself and towards others and, yeah. and being more yeah. understanding yeah. of how your own kind of escapist yeah. tendencies in the name of love have left you diminished and how you need to step a little bit more into your power yeah. to create yeah. a new paradigm that it's not the other person hurting you, yeah. that it might equally be you hurting you too and what's yours and what's theirs. This is a very heavy time for, for Aries, but remember the North Node is in your sign, Aries, and so you're being constantly driven to be more of yourself. The emphasis is really on you. With the, the, North, the South Node in Scorpio, the onus is less on partnership. Let the notion of fairness go, of you need to do more in partnership. You need to own more of your stuff and see how when you own more of your stuff and you simply acknowledge it in the moment, in the weather, you step more into your eighth house power. And, it, and again, that's going to change the mobile of your, of your structure. But if you want to make a change, everyone else needs to rise to you. And that first happens with you rising first. I hope this helps you, Aries. Taurus. If you are a Taurus uh, ascendant or a sun, now this is going to be, a, a, you know, this is a culmination of a four-year period where you have been asked to how much of your bullshit is lies with other people because you're afraid, right? That you might have the tendency to kind of spit a little white lie there, Taurus, right? With Venus being your ruler and Venus wanting to bring kind of um, graciousness to yeah. everything, right? Yeah. And also, too, yeah. because you are Taurus, you yeah. are always kind of coming from that emotional moon landscape that can have you acting out of fear, fear that you learned in your family units that you are kind of perpetuating, yeah. that you you might need to see, okay, well, you know, I'm not under the purview of my parents anymore, yeah. but this is the same fear that I'm acting out in my partnerships, in yeah. my relationships, right? So, yeah. Are you coming with ready-made excuses rather than actually just, you know, saying the kind of inside part that you don't want to say outside? Sometimes you have to say the outside part outside, the, the, the deepest, darkest parts outside, right? And it might be shocking and it might be cutting. It might be cutting to the other person, but it absolutely is cutting towards you, right? Stop kind of making yourself small Taurus with your little white lies and your bullshit excuses. Step more into your power of, oh no, no, you're hurting me, and, and but I'm hurting myself too. 
-hmm. And if I can't see that I'm hurting myself, I'm mm -hmm. going to continue to blame and hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're never going to be mm -hmm. in equilibrium mm -hmm. because that Libra, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is your everyday house. It's your sixth mm -hmm. house of what mm -hmm. you what yeah. you consign yourself to as work, right? Yeah. Have you kind of subjugated yeah. yourself to a situation in your work yeah. that then gets played out in yeah. your partnerships and in your one-on-one -on -one relationships? Yeah. Think about it. Yeah. How? Where are you bringing yeah. too much ease? Where are you sacrificing too yeah. much, right? Where have you self-sacrificed with Aries being yeah. your 12th house? Think about it, Taurus. Good luck. Yeah. Gemini. Yeah. Gemini, this is a fascinating time for you. And this is because that Scorpio energy is the sixth house. So this is what's called an inconjunct. And you can't, it's it's not energy that you kind of are consciously accessing, right? So for Geminis, they uh, very often will kind of run here, there, and everywhere being the person that um, puts out fires, right? Because they like to live in the extremes. Geminis like a lot of kind of um, variety. And so they're not really afraid to kind of go and put out fires for other people. Because in doing that, it makes them feel like they're really kind of strong, right? It's a way to kind of access that Mars energy. But because Aries is your 11th house, Gemini, um, you might have had to kind of subjugate the things that you most passionately wanted, right, uh, to um, survive in this world, right, to, to kind of be Pisces on the 12th house. You might have made a career of self-sacrificing. And so now you have to look at how does your need to kind of be Johnny on the spot, right? Uh, this is Papa was a Rolling Stone. Wherever lead it, he laid his hat was his home, right? Um, where have you kind of sacrificed um, notions of kind of giving to your partnerships with notions of, well, I work so hard. Right, I'm putting out fires here, there, and everywhere. And this kind of not actually bringing the fire to the partnership, it can get concretized in your eighth house with that being Capricorn. So, you know, Gemini's can kind of not understand how the work that they do every single day and how that kind of uh, feeds their Martian needs, how they can kind of diminish themselves in partnership and then how that becomes a cold and sterile environment in that eighth house. It's everything that we kind of do in the sixth house, it creates a sextile to that eighth house. And so you can kind of, through your work, be creating a system that keeps you not vulnerable with your partners and not known by your partners, but also kind of cheating yourself in the energetic exchange, suppressing your needs in that Capricorn energetic exchange house, and then uh, maybe kind of uh, rationalizing the things that you need to do to kind of get your needs met, right? There's no right or wrong. It's just these are patterns of who we are. Think about it, Gemini. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Cancer. Mm -hmm. All right, Cancer. If mm -hmm. if Cancer, I love I love you, Cancer. I do. I love you. And I and I'm gonna sh tell you something that you maybe never have considered, but it which is a strength and a and a gift of Cancer. Cancer gets to be a different sign every two and a half days, right? Because every two and a half days, the moon changes sign. And so Cancer gets to kind of try on all the other hats of all the other houses. And so that's why the stability that Cancer gets from its family is so important to understand. Because you will bring that into all the other houses of your landscape too. Now, for as a Cancer, that Scorpionic energy is the fifth house. And so you can make a sport Cancer of kind of commiserating. Right, you can you can definitely be in that kind of misery loves company that that becomes super fun, right? And that can be very dangerous for you, Cancer, because 
as a Cancer, a Libra is already the underworld for you. How you are in partnerships is already a kind of subconscious place, right? It is a very lunar place. Everything exists under the moon. And so you can kind of bring a lot of your subconscious um, sensations. Remember, uh, the, the moon is exalted in Taurus. So, and also too, Taurus is your 11th house of, of dreams and wishes and, and fears. Be careful what you wish for, right? And so you're really wrestling here now, uh, Cancer, with what, what, how do I creatively express myself, right? How do I kind of subjugate myself in partnership or with my family of origin? And how have I kind of um, refused to let myself be vulnerable in, in, in my self-expression, right? How have I kind of armored up to the teeth? Because I know that people are liars and cheaters and thieves, right? And I know, I, I try to bring my best self that cancer things, right? But if you don't own that darker self, then you are being that darker self to someone, somewhere, possibly in your family, but then also think about that too. You will concretize in your partnerships with a Capricorn being your opposite sign, what you are willing to kind of repress and suppress into the well, into the pit. It's time for you, Cancer, to really kind of step into your own power of what you want and need and love and not be afraid of it right? You're a passionate force of nature. You, you, you own all of the emotions and all of the consciousness and you get to try on everybody else's hat, which means if you focus on you and what you need at your core, you get to bring healing and nurturing and understanding to everyone as well as kind of chipping away some of the concrete in partnership and so you get more of the kind of Mars sex passion compassion that you're wanting in the fifth house and less of the kind of safety of Saturn in, in Capricorn yes and less of the status possibly in Capricorn possibly possibly not right because you can also have that in the eighth house where can you get in touch with the higher mind of the kind of sexual healing right? Well, Pluto's going to show that to you anyhow. So remember, these are, these are larger forces we're dealing with now. Every two and a half days, you have a new chance, Capricorn, uh, excuse me, Cancer. And so really be in touch when the fear comes up, take the minute, right? Your opposite sign is father time. Give yourself a minute, give yourself the pause to kind of consciously engage with the information of, well, the water's gonna pool somewhere, right? Do I wanna let it pool in the hurt or can I maybe siphon some of it over here to the kind of understanding and compassion and growth? Can I make that more of my creative process to make my life the masterpiece that I want? Take care, good luck with it. Leo, these are very heady times for you, Leo, right? Because with Leo, this Capricorn is your kind of, uh, excuse me, um, Scorpio is your underworld, right? So uh, Leos, because they see everything as their responsibility, may suppress their emotional needs that they taught were, that they found out were bad, right? It, it, when they were kids. And then they might kind of bring that detachment rather than bringing the passion to their relationships in Aquarius, they bring the detachment. So Leos have had a really kind of a rough ride, right? Because Pluto has been going through their sixth house. Work has become kind of Leo's bane of existence to a certain extent because they've had to kind of face every single thing that they do on a daily basis that keeps them uh, detached, right? Uh, that keeps the money, the pentacles, more important than the, uh, than the kind of partnership that you've been able to get, let that get cold and frigid. Well, you know, you have Saturn in Pisces right now, Leo, saying, 
No more, right? Saturn in Pisces saying, you need more. You are not going to override this pit of despair you've created, right? You need love and understanding from your partnerships. You let it get cold. And now it's time to kind of address and redress the hurts that you did to yourself every single day, right? That you let yourself behave badly and you found escapist tendencies, right? You can't escape anymore. Saturn in the eighth house won't let you anymore. It's almost going to be like a wave of sadness. Please see this for what it is. Let the eclipses take that, that, that way of thinking that you need to do it all and bring some of that fire into your relationships. Bring some of that joy, right? Think about it, Leo. Your ninth house is Aries, right? So that kind of embodied fire is your kind of connection to the divine, right? When you get kind of away from that kind of Saturn repression, the fire, the warmth, the, the passion, it's where you find God, right? Saturn and Pisces is trying to bring that back to you, Leo. Please, for the love of God, see this as an opportunity to kind of make peace with your needs, your Martian needs. They can't just live in the underworld. You, you have, you'll do more harm to yourself and to others, right? And also what you're kind of, think about the card of strength, right? Strength doesn't just mean that she's holding the lion back, meaning she owns her sexual energy. Yes, I'm thinking about the tarot card of strength. It also be means the part that you are repressing, that you are holding back, that is your life force, that is the Leo Leonine energy that is slowly but surely going to kill you too. Think about how you're using your strength, Leo. Take care. Virgo. Okay, Virgo. <laughs> okay, Virgo. So uh, Aries is your eighth house, right? So you're with this Mercury retrograde in Aries, you've been thinking about how you've kind of sacrificed in partnership, right? How you kind of maybe let the passion go in service to your higher ideals of the beautiful life you can create in partnership with other people. Right? So this Mercury retrograde has hopefully gotten you more in touch with yourself and how you own your fire. Right, This is very important for you, Virgo, because this fire is your, you know, Sagittarius is your fourth house, right? It, it, it is a kind of where you act out your kind of love of life with your family. So you need to own your fire with your family so you can experience it in the eighth house. You can have it in relationship, right? In the in the equal comings and goings, the kind of, for Virgos, you know, Aries and Pisces is elemental exchange. You cannot outthink it, Virgo, right? This is why Mars is the enemy of Athena. You cannot live in the mindscape. You cannot just repress and suppress all of your needs because they play out in your career, right? When you give too much mental credence in your life and you don't kind of learn to harness those primordial forces of partnership and energy exchange from everybody else of being vulnerable and allowing yourself to be vulnerable and to be open to judgment, you're killing off a lot of your passion, passion which then there trans translates into your career, okay? Think about that. You have to bring your whole self in all of your gifts, not just the gifts of your mind, the gifts of your, humi of your humility, right? The gifts of your kind of pure willingness to serve something greater in the, that every time you do things, every time you bring ease and graciousness and passion to everything is a new opportunity to create an, uh, the masterpiece, which is your life in partnership which is the energy exchange that can be. And then you live to tell the tale and you bring it into your career. That's how that access works for you. Excuse me, Virgo, my voice is going. I hope this helps for you. Libra. Excuse me, Libra. 
Oh, Leah, Libra. Scorpio for you is your second house. So this is the kind of interesting thing that happens to Libras is that they kind of, now I want to be clear about this Libra. Libras have Saturn exalted, right? So Libras can be, although I know you think about yourself as being incredibly flexible and self-serving and, and gracious and self-sacrificing to your partner, you can also be what I like to refer to, this is what I call my daughter, Iron Lion Zion. Meaning that in Libra, you are taking all of that kind of 11th house strength and, and repressive will of the kind of son of Leo, right? And you can kind of subjugate it in the 12th house and you can kind of get into your mindscape and think about it, right? And then you can bring that kind of mind of self undoing, which is the 12th house for you, Libra, and you bring that into your communications, but you, you also kind of subjugate your feeling body, right? You subjugate your own true needs, those kind of Aries needs that exist in the seventh house, which you also own too. You need to own your fire. And when you don't say, I'd really prefer this to that because you think you're bringing ease and compassion and, and uh, gracefulness right? What you really do is hiding and you're subjugating your true needs. And then you are fundamentally undermining your second house of self-worth and value from the work that you do in the world. My God, Libra, see it as that important. See it as using your kind of will in your Saturnine force to repress your own needs in partnership. Don't do it. Don't do it understand that you are just as much of an immovable force as that Aries partner that you see as so intimidating. You don't think you own that same fire. You do. You just are using it as an oppositional force. It's time for you to own the fire, bring it into your self-worth and value, and then bring all of that fire, all of that Martian source of strength, of will, of, of passion that you deserve, then all of that gets reclaimed in your partnerships in Aries. Think about it. Think about it, Libra, right? Use your rational mental faculties, right? And your Venusian gifts to reclaim some of that Mars, that bastard Mars that has been disowned. You need to kind of take him back in and, and remember your own passion. Think about it. Scorpio, if, this, if you're a Scorpio, this is all about you, right? This is all about how you use your will and how much you've kind of been able to kind of create the space for Mars to live, right? So in the day charts, if you know, if, if you're a day person, then Saturn is your exalted malefic and Mars is your is your malefic out of sect, which means that for day people, um, Mars is the what they really struggle because they're already in the kind of higher mind in the kind of the the the, the, the prophecy that is the sun, right? So, but for Scorpios, um, Mars Scorpio is the kind of the fall of the moon, right? The moon, the feelings don't do so well there. And it's only because they're kind of not allowed to own the Mars a lot of times. It's like you, you don't get to, to own, it's like that's where we take our blame and our shame, right? Is it to Scorpio? And so very often Scorpios can cultivate their own sense of, well, I can only be that way, right? It has to be that way. That kind of paradigm, paradigm destroying energy, right? It can kind of get turned in on itself and make you so fearful that you are afraid of all change. For Scorpios, this moon that is squaring um, Aquarius well, that's going to be in your 10th house, right? Is that right? So let me see. 
Scorpios, Taurus, Tor not Taurus, Leo. Oh, I'm sorry, it's in your underworld. My mistake. So for Scorpios, that Aquarian, that uh, so for Scorpios, that uh, Pluto square is going to come. Is going to come to your home and family, the foundation of your life. Okay, so as uh, a Scorpio, it's time for you to kind of understand how the ways that you've kind of lied or cheat and manipulated, they kind of have possibly inherently were learned through your family of origin, right? And so uh, Pluto's there now to show you that everything that you needed to survive your family of origin is now kind of going to face the plutonic scrutiny. And so you're ne you're needing to kind of get go into the higher mind. You're really kind of needing to kind of make friends with the notion of compassion and understanding because your entire foundation is about to get changed as a Scorpio Pluto moving into your fourth house is saying that all of this kind of ancestral history is coming for a reckoning now and the more you can kind of understand how your need for control has also kept things alive that needed to go and also how your need for kind of creature comforts have cheated you out of the love and the compassion that you deserve in, in partnerships. And how your kind of need to be seen as the light, as the Leo, right, has, has also made everything your responsibility and therefore also all of the blame and shame, okay? For Scorpios, it's really wrestling with the self, of, with the demons of the self, and try to reclaim some of the kind of pride in the, in the ways that you've tried to bring graciousness to your life. And maybe it hasn't been, it hasn't worked for you, right? But that also too, you need that graciousness inherently. So you have to find a way to bring it into your life. And that's always through partnership. So even when you haven't given an inch, you've only ever cheated yourself out of it, right? That there needs to be inherent fairness in all of your relationships, Scorpio. Otherwise, you are hurting yourself and you are controlling and hanging on to things that are already dead. I hope this helps you, Scorpio. Sagittarius. Sagittarius for you, Scorpio, is your 12th house of self-undoing. This is where Sagittarius will very often kind of put all of those hurtful feelings that they inherited kind of in their childhood or from their mother, right? Meaning that Sagittarius' eighth house is, the, is cancer, right? So that's the things we're most afraid to look at. And so that kind of double-edged sword of Yes, most certainly kind of what you needed. Let me put it like this. For Sages, a Scorpio being your house of self undoing makes you very often afraid to own the vulnerability that you face every single day in the work that you do in the world, right? So in the sixth house, that's the joy of Mars. Rather than kind of um, doing the kind of deep emotional work that the Scorpio 12th house, this dismantling of how you've kind of used your kind of male, Martian, um, god of war ethic, how you've taken that and you've applied it to the work that you do in the world every day, to making money, to, to, to making Taurus bank, right? So... While you've been doing that, all of the stuff, all of the kind of real 12th house strength, the real kind of dragon that lives inside of you, that has created a sextile to your Capricorn kind of 
um, notions of status in this world or how the kind of fruits of your everyday work have kind of concretized themselves into your second house of self-worth and value, okay, that exists in Capricorn. So if you don't see how this 12th house, 6th house dynamic has played out for you and how you kind of need to go back into the into the past, right? Into the house of the eighth house of your of your greatest fears, right? Of the death, things that you'd rather be dead than look at, about how you were nurtured and how you kind of received love from your family and what was terrifying about that, but also what was good about it, right? That there was this if you're here, then your mother did her job in nurturing you. You're still alive, right? But there's always going to be conflicting emotions for you, uh, Sagittarius, when it comes to thinking about notions of intuition and nurturing, right? Because we're talking about, we're talking about, ultimately, what we're talking about is, is owning the Aries fire that is the fifth house, right? Um, Sagittarius's uh, who don't understand that it starts when you were a little kid, right? With that Aries energy, how were you allowed to kind of step into the anger and be angry? Or did you have to subjugate that? Was that part of your kind of learning how to get along on a daily basis, right? And, and so how did you take that and that kind of refusal to be vulnerable into your partnerships? right? Where sometimes partnerships can be very transactional and you can try to think, try to keep it on this rational plane of existence. It's not possible. It's not possible. See this full, full moon now and the energy as it unfurls from the full moon as being kind of more of you addressing that Aries fire of the first of the fifth house of when you were a child and your life as your kind of creative self-expression and how you own your passion because then you bring that passion into your house of partnership gemini right so you're not a jack of all trades master of none you're you're trying to be a master of the self and then you bring that into partnership because when you own your fire more in partnership you're you're repressing less of it into the eighth house of cancer you're going to get more of your emotional needs met and you're going to actually do the work of the self undoing that the 12th house count calls for. I hope that this makes sense to you, Sagittarius. Good luck with it. Capricorn, everything I said to Sag applies to you, right? Think about it. Scorpio is your 11th house of hopes and wishes and dreams for everything that's in this world. But with those ho hopes and wishes and dreams, it also brings your greatest fears, right? And so... You know, these are fears you're well versed with. Mm -hmm. Think, uh, noticing, thinking always that your seventh house is cancer, right? So uh, no one is more impacted of, uh, with, of course, the mother-father <laughs> dynamic, but also to the power of eclipses, but also to the power of kind of owning that Aries-Taurus energy, right? Because... For Capricorns, what ends up being their 10th house of legacy is Libra, is partnership. Their house of self undoing is Aries. It always starts with the self, right? Of knowing how your family systems in it with Aries forced you to kind of become incredibly in, internal, interior. I'm sure that that's probably what a lot of this Mercury, was, Mercury retrograde was about, about how your kind of fire and owning your passion has forced you into the hell realms and made you feel like maybe you were betraying yourself, right? And so therefore you took that into the kind of pain, but also the safety of relationships. Right. And that how you have to work that out if you need to get if you want to get to the best of what relationships in Libra can be. OK, you're not going to outthink it. You need to feel it. Right. Because if you want to get to your hopes and dreams, which is Scorpio, you're going to have to go back through the past. And now is really the time to do it. It's the only way that Scorpionic energy and owning that passion and that fire 
that that is the underworld for you is the only way to kind of break out of these concretized behaviors that that capricorns are so good at that you could feel like you're dead when you're not yet dead think about it aquarius if you are aquarius then scorpio is the top of your chart right so Scorpio, you will be famous, you will be known for, it. your legacy is how you deal with people who kind of um, live in the reactiveness of the, of the, of the world, right? So uh, Capricorns are inherently healers, right? Because they, they can be the star. Uh, sorry, did I say Capricorns? Well, that too, but Aquariuses are the star, right? They come from a kind of sense of, I'm a little bit different. I'm a little bit awkward. I'm different from everyone else. It's like being an alien to a certain extent. I love people, Leo being your opposite sign. I, I, I want to connect in that fiery way. It just feels so foreign. Why is that? Well, think about it. Your self-worth and value is, is generally determined in the second house of Pisces where you self-sacrifice, right? And then your third house of communication is Aries. So you, you feel alienated and, and separate and alone and unloved and then you self-sacrifice in the work that you do every day or maybe that was what you were born into and you had to. And then you take it to the third house of how you communicate in that Aries fire can get like kind of all sped up and used up just by grinding out the daily existence, right? And then you come into the kind of Taurus, underworld, right? Where all you kind of understand is the small niceties of life, that simp that the simple kind of graces of life, right? But what you really want is the love and the passion that is Scorpio. What you... Uh, Aquariuses are kind of so fundamentally separate from everyone else. It, it, it creates a unique ability to deal with the kind of extremes of life that is Scorpio, right? Uh, you know, People who have heavy kind of um, cancer or Capricorn or or Aquarius, they go into kind of the, the law enforcement or healing professions, doctors, right? Think about the Asclepius. Think about the kind of uh, the, 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 the mental scape that it takes to be a doctor, right? You go from the kind of Virgo th thinking you concretize that into Capricorn and then it becomes the healing of of Aquarius. Well, Aquariuses are uniquely adept at kind of subjugating their feelings so that they actually can do crisis work with people. They, they, they can di be so disconnected because it's, it's what they most want to connect to. They just don't want to have to get to the kind of tragedy or the kind of catastrophe that it very often takes to break them out of those concretized cycles that can be Capricorn in the 12th house, okay? How can you access the, the kind of higher emotions or the higher will drive, right? Without bringing down the tower. It's something to think about. Pluto is gonna help you. It's a 20 year process. Remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. It won't be dismantled in a day, but it really starts with you kind of owning more of that fire. Take care. It starts in the mind. That should feel comforting. Take care. Pisces. Okay, Pisces. So Pisces, your opposite sign is Virgo, right? So all of that kind of churning and that kind of whirlpool that can be Pisces of kind of self sacrifice and self-sacrifice, right? That kind of Neptunian um, garnering, marshalling of all of the kind of primal forces can kind of make um, Pisces not too good at the details, right? Because Pisces opposite house is Virgo. 
So Pisces can get lost in the sauce, meaning that they're lost in the higher mind, they're lost, lost in all of the emotions, right? So that Pisces actually kind of needs to go into Scorpio, needs to go into the kind of ninth house. Think about it like this. For Pisces, you're not so good with the details of partnership, right? So, which means you don't maybe do the kind of daily work of Virgo, right? And when you don't do the daily work, then your eighth house is Aries. You might find yourself feeling very, no, I'm sorry, Pisces, Aries, Virgo, Libra, excuse me. All right. So if you don't do the kind of daily work, the kind of judgment level thinking and detail oriented, oh my God, look at my eye, can you see it? Detail oriented work, right? If you don't bring that every day, you probably brought that to your family of origin or what you were born into because that Aries in the second house is very primal. You're really fighting. You really believe in your family. You really have conviction for everything they stand for, right? But if you don't kind of Yes, of course, you understand your own power and what you bring to the dynamic, right? But if you don't understand how it's on a daily basis, right? Which is, all right, joy for you, right? The joy of life for Pisces, the creative self-expression is cancer. Right? So being a mother very often is very important or to have a family, a family of their own or kind of honoring the, the maternal uh, lessons, right? Or the kind of feeling body of what I need right now, right? But that can get very confusing for Pisces because that fifth house cancer, creative self-expression, that changes hats every day, right? Every two days, two and a half days, that moon in the fifth house, it's gonna change kind of vistas or vehicles. And so your passion, your, your creative self-expression in Cancer gets brought, gets brought into Leo in the sixth house, right? The fire, right? So you go from the, from the airy self-worth and value, you channel that fire into the work that you do every day, which might be a mother in the fifth house. And then that becomes the work every day, right? And so then from that Leo pride of being a mother, being a family member, of the pride of the father and who your father was, you bring that into the Virgo house of self-sacrifice. So if you don't get a handle on that Aries fire, you are subjugating that Leo fire in the sixth house, right? And then you bring that into partnership where you know so good in the details, right? You may be a little lost in the sauce. And then you bring that into the your the feeling body of relationships. And so you can take the passion that you inherently feel in yourself and it, you can let it dry up in your relationships. You can kind of Saturnize it. You can concretize it. And then it became, becomes based on the family unit, which is all of the underworld for you, Pisces, right? And then you bring those kind of family values out to everybody else, but you lost a lot of the fire down here. And then so how much fire can you bring up here, right? You regain that fire in your faith, in your kind of the higher mind in the ninth house. And so that is Scorpio. And so being able to understand that, yes, people mess up. You have messed up. You have hurt others just as much as you have been hurt. That allows you the unique ability to kind of bring that forgiveness, not just to yourself, but to others, right? To get the higher mind. And then you bring more forgiveness to yourself. You step more into your fire that was suppressed, that you suppressed, maybe that you learned at a young age to suppress. And you bring more of the fire to your daily living. And then that plays out in your relationships. I hope that this helps you, Pisces. Again, I'm Jennifer Swales from Honeybee Astrology. Um, this was the Scorpio full moon. Take care until we connect again.
All the best.